as some of you would know, under the current BJP regime led by Narendra Modi, there is a massive push towards privatization of education in the new education policy, which would restrict access to education and especially higher education for millions. Apart from these, the state has also directly interfered in the higher education sector, attacking academic freedom and academics. We are making university appointments on the basis of political affiliations, censorship, increasing surveillance, physical attacks, arbitrary arrest and detention of faculty members and students, denial of visas and restrictions on academic exchanges. I provide a couple of examples, and this is just in the last couple of years. Uh, so firstly, 16 scholars and activists have been falsely implicated in the Bhima Koregao case, completing three years in prison. Several such as Gautam Nablaka, Vaiva Rao and Shoma Sen have been repeatedly denied bail and subjected to inhuman treatment while being refused basic necessities and medical attention. One of them, Father Stan Swami, a tribal rights activist, passed away recently while the rest continue to be imprisoned. The works of two Dalit scholars have been removed from the Delhi University syllabus without providing any academic logic. Uh, we have also seen faculty members such as Abra Ahmed and Sudipta Bhattacharya being suspended for their social media tweets and, and different political views. In March 2021, all overseas citizens of India now will have to take special permission from the government of India for any journalistic or research work. Additionally, Kashmiri students can be denied passports and visas if they have participated in any anti-national activity. Um, before we begin, I would also like to highlight that one of our own panel members could not be could not join us today due to multiple threats. This in itself is a telling example of the way these Hindu supremacist attacks are orchestrated. Keeping that in mind, I want to thank all the panel members and organizers once again and applaud their courage to continue doing the work they do despite the threats to you know their lives and their families. I will now introduce the panelists in order of their speaking and invite them to make their opening remarks. I would request the panel members to kindly keep their remarks in between six to seven minutes, after which we will open to a Q&A round. Um, audience members are requested to type their questions into the Q&A box, along with mentioning whom the question is directed to. Uh, so today, our first speaker will be Professor Apoor Vanand who teaches Hindi at the University of Delhi. He writes literary criticism and also on the issues of culture and education. His work has appeared in all major Hindi journals and he also writes regularly as a political commentator for prominent Indian and international newspapers. His most recent co-edited book is titled Education at the Crossroads. Secondly, we have Professor Deepa Kumar, who is an award-winning scholar and social justice activist. She is a professor of media studies at Rutgers University and her critically acclaimed book, Islamophobia and the Politics of Empire has been translated into five languages. Uh, Thomas Blom Hansen is the Reliance Dhirubhai Ambani Professor of Anthropology and the Chair of the Department of Anthropology at Stanford University. He has written extensively on Hindu nationalism, Hindu-Muslim conflicts, urban conflicts in India, as well as melancholia, memory, and cultural politics in post-apartheid South Africa. His most recent book is The Law of Force on the Violent Heart of Indian Politics. And we have Professor Audrey Trushke, who is an Associate Professor of South Asian History at Rutgers University in New Jersey. She received her PhD in 2012 from Columbia University and her research focuses on the cultural, imperial and intellectual history of medieval and early modern India, as well as the politics of history in modern times. She is a founding member of the South Asia Scholar Activist Collective and also one of the authors of the Hindutva Harassment Field Manual. I would now kindly request Professor Apoornan to start. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annapurna. Uh, and I must thank the organizers for uh, holding this very important uh, webinar. This is an issue we want the world to uh, know about. Uh, I have prepared a note since I had to keep myself confined to the time frame suggested by the organizers. Uh, the idea of academic freedom, sadly, has become redundant in India. The primary reason for it is the complete takeover of all institutions by the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, which is the political wing of the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, RSS, a fascist organization which works in the name of Hindu supremacy. It is not only Hindu supremacy it aims to establish, 
it wants to subjugate and, if possible, eliminate Muslim and Christian identities in India. The last seven years have seen progressive escalation of violence on Muslims and Christians using laws, administrative machinery, ideological campaign, and physical assaults. We are talking about attack on academic freedom in a context in which Muslims have almost lost their freedom to express themselves, associate, and have their own way of living. Academic freedom is the freedom of academics to frame, design, and teach their courses free of any extra academic pressure, freedom to choose their research areas and pursue them, and not be deprived of institutional support for ideological or political reasons. It requires institutional autonomy in all areas. It also means the freedom of the academic to participate in public conversation without any fear of penal action from the state or the institutions they work on. Collaboration with other institutions and academics should be a decision taken without any political fear. If we look at the Indian academic uh, scene today, the situation is bleak in all areas mentioned above. Academic spaces are controlled by, uh, uh, by appointing vice chancellors or directors who toe the line of the state and follow the ideological dictate of the RSS, many a times without even being asked. The apex regulating body in the field of higher education in India, the University Grants Commission, wants all universities to adopt the curriculum and syllabus drafted by it with the provision of only 20% of it to be decided by their respective universities. Uh, uh, you can understand that this is centrally controlling all academic programs uh, of all the universities. The education ministry keeps sending circulars through the University Grants Commission to the higher education institutions, asking them to hold seminars or programs on themes decided by it. Rules have been framed, depriving the teachers of having and expressing their own opinion if it goes against the state. They cannot publish without the permission of the university authorities, especially if it is critical of the state policies. Many central universities in India, which are centrally funded, have adopted these service rules. Not only have they, uh, not only that, they are forbidden to make any collective representation even about uh, academic and logistical issues. Recently, three teachers of the Central University in Bihar were issued show cause notice for having written collectively asking for internet facility on the campus for online classes. Before that, a general warning was issued after one of the faculty members published an article critical of the ideology of the ruling party. At this point of time, most of the universities have vice chancellors who have some organizational link with the RSS or its affiliates. They create an atmosphere which is so intimidating that the teachers prefer to remain silent. Secondly, the muscle power of the student wing of the RSS known as the Akhil Bharti Vidyarthi Parishad is unleashed. There are scores of examples of Akhil Bharti Vidyarthi Parishad attacking seminars, film screenings, uh, theater uh, uh, programs, beating up the participants, lodging criminal cases against the organizers and speakers for hurting their sentiments or alleging anti-nationalist tendencies behind such activities. This violence spreads to classrooms too. This clear teacher at, a central university, at the Central University of Kerala was suspended by the university after the ABVP made a complaint against his class lecture on fascism. He was forced to tender apology to get the suspension revoked. There are scores of such examples from across India. It has become nearly impossible for academics to hold seminars as the list of participants is scrutinized by the authorities and unsuitable names struck off. We know about incidents in which invitations have been withdrawn or seminars canceled. You cannot discuss issued with, with which RSS or ruling party, about which the RSS or ruling party is sensitive. Readings are censored and removed, which fall out of favor of the people affiliated to or willing to please the RSS. For example, last month's text by two feminist Dalit writers from Tamil Nadu and Mahashwata Devi were removed by the authorities of the University of Delhi from the undergraduate syllabus of the Department of English, despite protests from the faculty since they were found to be politically incorrect. Last year, the government issued an order asking the universities 
first get the approval of the government for outside India had to participate or university or centers from outside India were collaborating. After, uh, am I audible? Am I audible? Hello, am I audible? Uh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. There was a slight break, but oh. yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Last year, the uh, government issued an order asking the universities to first get the approval of the government before holding any seminar or academic activity in, in which scholars from outside India were participating or universities or centers from outside India were collaborating. After an, an international approach, it was withdrawn. But now the universities seem to have started doing it informally, two months by investing in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, a central province of India was forced to withdraw from a seminar organized jointly with a US-based university as the university insisted that the head of the department should have obtained permission from the central government. It needs to be mentioned that it was done after the ABVP objected to some names in the list of the speakers. Another aspect which is generally ignored is of publishing. It has become extraordinarily difficult in India for academics to publish books or papers on subjects which are politically or ideologically sensitive. A long legal vetting of the manuscript has become a norm, and very often the writers are asked to remove portions. It might attract violent attention from the RSS affiliates or legal cases by them. I think one of the panelists would, uh, would uh, bear me out uh, that now you have Indian edition and US edition of the same book. Uh, different content because you can't have some content or publisher in India. Uh, finally, this regime has successfully defamed the very act of intellection. University like the JNU or Delhi University have been portrayed as dens of anti-nationals. Teachers and students have been painted as idlers who waste the taxpayers' hard-earned money. The act of critical thinking is seen as a seditious act, uh, which is also anti-national. The prime minister himself mocked higher education by saying that it is hard work that counts or matters and not hard work. Generally, universities are seen as being sympathetic to Muslims and the un underprivileged and the majoritarian anger is stoked against them. In this commonsensical frame, it is very easy, easy to delegitimize outlaw even a semblance of academic freedom. I uh, stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Apurvanan. Um, This is just a small reminder that everybody can put their questions uh, in the in the question and answer chat box. Other than that, the chat has been disabled for all uh, participants. Um, can I now please invite Professor Deepa Kumar to to penny address the panel? Can you hear me? Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this congressional briefing. I am pleased to do so, not least because Hindu supremacist forces have violated my academic freedom. But before I explain how my TEDx talk was canceled this past summer and the threats faced by a conference, a very important conference this coming weekend, I want to start by saying a little bit about my own family. My great-grandfather, H.R. Gurva Reddy, was part of the national liberation struggle against British colonialism in India. My grand-uncle, K.C. Reddy, was a leading figure in the struggle for independence in the state of Karnataka. When India ended colonial rule in 1947, he went on to become the first chief minister of Karnataka. The house I grew up in has a portrait of the framers of the Indian constitution, and my great-grandfather, who was featured in that photo, would regale me with stories of what he and other members of my extended family had done to secure a free and democratic India. So I grew up from an early age learning about how India was formed as a sovereign, socialistic, secular, democratic republic. And this is what we were taught in civics lessons as well. And we took democracy, free speech, secularism, and other such values seriously. In Bangalore, where I attended school, we had a plurality of religious groups who all studied together. 
Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, and Parsis. In fact, it was not at all uncommon for young people to have good friends from various religious groups. My family and extended family are Hindus, but we had and continue to have close friends among all religious groups. This is not to say, however, that anti-Muslim animosity didn't exist or that religious groups were not pitted against one another. I don't want to present some sort of golden age free of conflict and repression because that was never the case. However, there has been an alarming move away from secularism and democratic values over the last three decades, thanks to the advances of the forces that promote Hindutva. I want to state very clearly that Hindutva and Hinduism are not the same. Hindutva is a political philosophy that draws on European style fascism of the early 20th century. Its goal is to create a Hindu nation. In this, Hindu supremacists are not unlike white supremacists in this country who want to create a white nation. Hindutva is deeply casteist and racist towards all religious minorities, particularly Muslims. There are, by the way, over 200 million Muslims who live in India. Let me also state clearly that criticizing Hindutva is not anti-Hindu or Hindu-phobic, a baseless term that is used to silence critics of the BJP, the ruling party, and its various supporters and affiliates. While South Asians do face discrimination in the US and elsewhere, this is not because they are Hindu. I say this as a scholar of race and as someone who has spent a considerable amount of time studying race and racism. Now this past May, I was invited to give a TEDx talk on Islamophobia for students at the Manipal Academy of Higher Education in Karnataka. My talk was based on my book, Islamophobia and the Politics of Empire. I was going to talk about the concept of race and how anti-Muslim racism functions. The students who invited me were eager to learn about this topic. However, almost as soon as they posted the, media, the event on social media, they were barraged by threats from Hindu supremacists. To be clear, the talk was not about India or the BJP, but apparently even mentioning and discussing Islamophobia was just too much for these forces. I was smeared in social media and called a terrorist. And even though the students who were organizing the stock wanted to carry on with it, and they were supported by faculty as well, the vice chancellor canceled the talk. I am also here to speak on behalf of the organizers of an academic conference titled Dismantling Global Hindutva, Multidisciplinary Perspectives. I will be speaking at this conference and was invited to attend a meeting this past Sunday to hear from conference organizers about the threats they have faced. The conference organizing committee includes a list of professors from the US, the UK, Europe, and the conference itself is co-sponsored by more than 70 academic departments, centers, institutes, or programs from 53 universities, including Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, Columbia, UC Berkeley, the University of Chicago, the University of Pennsylvania, Rutgers, and many others. In spite of the strong academic coalition, the conference has been subjected to overwhelming attack, both in India and in the United States. Fringe groups have placed immense pressure upon universities to back out of the conference. The line of attack has been to falsely characterize the conference as anti-Hindu, even though conference organizers made it clear right from the start on the website that they are critiquing the 100-year-old fascist-inspired Hindutva ideology. I was informed by organizers that Hindu supremacists have bombarded university servers with this disinformation, sending close to 1 million emails to presidents, provosts, and other officials at co-sponsoring universities. At Drew University, for example, the servers registered over 30,000 emails within a few minutes. Um, and of course, universities have not uh, succumbed to this pressure. This disinformation has had no effect. In fact, not a single co-sponsor has backed out of this conference. 
Professors and administrators across the world recognized the bullying for what it was, were informed about the facts, and rejected the pressure. Electronic attacks on the conference have included attempts to shut down the Eventbrite registration page. The Facebook page was shut down, but organizers are working to reinstate it. The conference website was taken down for a period of two days, and there was a successful attack on the conference email address, shutting it down for a day. In addition to this, conference speakers have been threatened and intimidated on social media. You will be hearing from my colleague, Professor Audrey Trushke, who, while not being either a speaker or an organizer of this conference, has received multiple death threats simply for tweeting about the conference. In short, the tactics honed in India to destroy academic freedom, as Professor Apurvanand outlined uh, just a few minutes ago, are now being deployed in the United States. In India, the conference was attacked on primetime television shows run by known far-right Hindutva-affiliated news anchors. They have claimed that the conference is funded by everyone from George Soros to the CIA to other foreign governments. Another claim was that the conference was designed to support the Taliban. Subsequently, far-right fringe groups were mobilized to attack the speakers of the conference. One such group is the Hindu Jana Jagruti Samiti, an organization known to have been involved in the murders of intellectuals and journalists, such as Gobind Pansari, Narendra Dabolkar, uh, M. M. Kalburgi, and Gauri Lankesh. They have also written to the Ministry of Home Affairs in India, asking for, this, asking for state action against conference speakers. We are deeply concerned that all this misinformation taken together will be used to incarcerate those who speak at the conference or worse, inflict bodily harm. As a result of these threats, some speakers have understandably withdrawn from the conference. However, the vast majority, I understand, have said that they would continue with their presentations. Ironically, the attack on the conference by Hindutva forces has demonstrated why it is so necessary and so important. I am here to emphasize the alarming and serious threat that Hindu supremacists pose to scholars in the US. This is not only a threat to free speech and academic freedom, but also a threat to the safety and security of these scholars. I therefore urge Congress to take seriously these threats to academic freedom and to protect the scholars who have been threatened and intimidated by Hindu supremacists. Finally, I want to say that if my great grandfather and grand uncle were alive today, they would be deeply saddened by what India has become. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much, Professor Deepa. And uh, once again, I would like to remind the attendees that you can only post your questions in the Q&A. Uh, I see a couple of hands being raised, but we're not um, at that stage yet. So please post your questions in the Q&A. I would now like to invite Professor Thomas uh, Blom and to, to make their opening remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to share my perspective on, on Hindu nationalism and how uh, Hindu nationalist organizations have tried over many years to influence, limit, and distort debates and teaching on uh, U.S. university campuses. Now, <clears throat> I, I've conducted field research and written about Hindu nationalism in India for about three decades. Along with many other scholars, I've documented in several books the rise of the Hindu nationalist movement in India from a marginal movement in the 1930s to its current political dominance in the country. Its main organization, as has been mentioned, RSS was inspired by European fascism and is to this day organized as a uniformed paramilitary outfit devoted to fight Muslims and other minorities. Let's not forget that RSS was never part of the nationalist movement. It never supported India's democratic constitution. It was banned three times since 1948, including for complicity in the murder of Gandhi. Today, the RSS and allies claim against all historical and sociological facts to represent true Indian nationalism and the sentiments of the majority of Hindus. Now, when I began work on these issues, the Hindu nationalist movement was smaller and without the position of immense political power and lavish funding that it commands today. 
The core of the movement, the RSS, was slowly extending its net networks across the world, not least in the US, in Canada, and in the UK. In the 90s, I and others who published and spoke on the movement and its ideology were routine, routinely subjected to heckling from audience, mem audience members. I received hostile letters and emails calling me names, accusing me of being Hindu phobic and of embracing Muslim terrorist organizations. Decades later, at the time of Modi's election victory in 2014, Hindu nationalists had become extremely active on social media and various websites. Several of them, such as the aptly named site Shadow Warrior, followed and monitored what they claimed were anti-Indian and anti-Hindu programming and research at South Asia related centers, including the center at Stanford that I was directing for many years. I received threatening emails on a regular basis, but nothing I found would warrant reporting it to campus security. That all changed in 2016 when two things happened. First, occasioned by Modi's visit to the US that included meetings with the tech giants of Silicon Valley, I was one of more than 100 signatories of an open letter to the leaders of the tech industry reminding them that Modi belonged, one, to a deeply anti-democratic political movement, and two, that he, as a chief minister of Gujarat in 2002, had presided over one of the worst anti-Muslim pogroms India has seen. This pogrom was the reason why Modi was barred from entry into the US for about a decade. The publication of this letter generated a deluge of letters and emails directed at all the signatories and our institutions. We were issued death threats, several emails and anonymous letter letters would contain passages like, we are watching you, we know where you live, we know where your kids go to school, and so on and so forth. Those of us who were white were described as racist and colonialist, while those of the signatories who were South Asian background were called sepoys, like the Indian troops serving in the British colonial army. The implication was, of course, that by criticizing Modi, they, US-based academics of Indian background, were serving the white master. The women on the list of signatories were targets of the most intense abuse. The office of the president at Stanford received a formal letter signed by a self-described group of about 50 self-described patriotic Hindus and businessmen who demanded that I be dim immediately dismissed from Stanford. Uh, fortunately, of course, my institution has uh, uh, stood by me on this occasion and other occasions. The second event was a dispute in 2016-17 over how South Asian history is described in California's textbooks. The directors of South Asia centers at universities across California presented what we regarded as the scholarly consensus on South Asian history before the state's curriculum commission. On the other side stood the Hindu American Foundation, an integral part of the larger network of Hindu nationalist organizations in the US. In that campaign, the Hindutva activists presented themselves as ordinary concerned members of the Hindu minority in the US. They argued that they wanted their culture and history to be presented in a positive light, but their real agenda was to erase any mention of the caste system and erase the significant presence of Islam, Buddhism, and other religious uh, traditions in the subcontinent for centuries. Before the commission, the Hindutva activists presented themselves as an embattled religious minority of color in the US, but they are not. They were not. They were, in effect, doing the bidding of a major political movement and a government in India trying to influence how American students are educated. I and others pointed this out in press interviews such as the New York Times. Predictably, this was followed by another barrage of hostile and threatening emails and letters demanding my resignation, threatening physical harm, lawsuits, and much more. Now, let me conclude with some points. One, it's clear that the campaign to suppress critical scholarship and discussion of Hindutva has escalated over the past decades. Modi's victory in 2014 gave many Hindutva activists a sense of impunity and government support. However, such forms of abuse are, are in fact illegal acts that need to be reported to the police and to campus security immediately. US-based academics are protected by the law and their institutions need to step up and assist in that task rather than worry about reputations or potential donors. And I have to say that many of them, most of them have. Two, we, need, we should not accept 
when fact-based critical scholarly examination of, of a phenomenon like the political project of majoritarian Hindutva is equated with a critique of Hinduism or Hindus as such. Such an equation dangerously reduces all knowledge production to a form of identity politics and partisan positioning. Three, finally, Hindutva activists do not represent Hindus as such. They actually represent the interests of a foreign government. The true face of the Hindutva project in India and the rest of the world needs to be understood and documented relentlessly. US-based academics need to be part of this work and uphold the value of fact-based scholarship against partisan forces in India, in the US, and the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Thomas. Um, I would now like to invite Professor Audrey Trushke to uh, kindly address the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone for being here. Hindu nationalism is a political ideology that advocates for Hindu supremacy and the exclusion of members of other Indian religious groups from equal participation in Indian society. It is a fiercely anti-intellectual ideology in both conception and practice. And I want to speak with you all today specifically about the threat that this hateful political movement, also known as Hindutva, is posing in real time to academic freedom in the United States. So I am Associate Professor of South Asian History at Rutgers University, the State University of New Jersey. For more than five years, I have received hate mail from Hindu nationalists or Hindu supremacists almost every single day. I have been the target of so many death and rape threats that I have lost count. The most recent violent threat against me was made last week via phone to a general Rutgers phone number by a man spouting Hindu supremacist rhetoric. The police are investigating. My family too have been threatened with all manner of violence, including my children who are ages three, five and seven at present. I often require armed security when I speak publicly, whether about modern South Asia or ancient Indian history. The last time I gave a public lecture was less than two weeks ago in the Western suburbs of Chicago. To ensure both my safety and the safety of the audience, there were multiple armed security personnel present. I want to emphasize how extraordinary and how worrisome it is that I require armed protection on US soil to speak about areas of my scholarly expertise. I am the target of repeated smears and misinformation campaigns. Hindu nationalist groups have tried unsuccessfully so far to prompt my employer, Rutgers University, to take punitive action against me. Many Hindu supremacists openly discuss trying to influence the New Jersey state government, elected officials, and Rutgers administrators in order to silence me, a scholar. Some of this harassment has come from overseas and a certain share comes from the United States. In fact, Hindu supremacists who were born and raised on US soil have taken over a leadership role in the relentless attacks against me in recent months. What have I done to merit such treatment, you might ask? My scholarship explores the truth about Indian history that South Asia has always been a diverse place where many cultural and religious groups coexist. And this basic fact poses a huge challenge to the political project of Hindu nationalism. Hindu supremacists find so much of South Asian history threatening, especially the many parts featuring Muslims. I am an expert on Hindu and Muslim interactions in the 16th and 17th centuries. And the same folks who attack me for teaching about Muslims in India's past also demonize Muslims today as their primary enemy, as the main group to dehumanize as a foil for advocating for Hindu supremacy. In fact, Hindu nationalists largely sat out India's independence struggle against British colonial rulers in the first half of the 20th century. And that is because they, the Hindu nationalists, identified Muslims rather than the British as their primary enemy. 
Muslims are still Hindu supremacist's favorite group to hate. And those of us who research and teach Indo-Muslim history are further carnage in this brutal assault. While I am a favorite target of US-based Hindu supremacists, I am not exceptional. Many other scholars of South Asia have been targeted as well, as you have heard, not only by nationalists overseas, but also by US citizens who are part of this homegrown branch of Hindu supremacist hate. And in fact, Hindu supremacists based in the United States have been some of the leaders in the campaign of fear and intimidation against the dismantling global Hindutva conference that's occurring in a couple of days. Now the Hindu supremacist attacks against me and numerous other scholars reached a crescendo of sorts in March and April of 2021 in a series of coordinated attacks. That experience plus years of, years of enduring vitriol prompted me and about 20 colleagues to form the South Asia Scholar Activist Collective. We, SASIC for short, are a group of North America-based academics who believe in the twin pillars of humanities scholarship and inclusive progressive politics. Our first act as a collective was to author the Hindutva Harassment Field Manual, a freely available online resource that explains Hindu supremacist hate, also known as Hindutva, and how it's organized. The field manual covers how Hindu supremacists make bad faith claims of bias, trying to hide their bigotry behind the smokescreen of Hinduism, a move that is very offensive to many Hindus. The field manual also talks about the long list of people and groups that Hindu nationalism hurts, including Muslims, lower castes, especially Dalits, indigenous peoples, Christians, academics, students, and Hindus. The field manual offers guidance and resources for how to navigate Hindu nationalist assaults for targets, allies, students, and university administrations. As a member of the South Asia Scholar Activist Collective, I hope that this field manual will help others weather these horrific attacks but we need to do more. Hindu supremacists are infringing on academic freedom in both India and the United States right now. And we need to stop that. One final point. Earlier this year, my research on Hindu nationalism led me to focus on a group that promotes Hindu supremacist ideas in the United States, the Hindu American Foundation. In May, as my research was ongoing, that group sued me. The lawsuit is a blatant attempt to frustrate my research and to chill academic freedom for all who study South Asian related topics. My attorneys have articulated these points in a motion to dismiss that is pending. This lawsuit is the most recent line of attack in a concerted set of pressures that aim to stop scholarly work and to exert Hindu supremacist control over academics. Such goals are simply put, unacceptable and anti-intellectual. I hope you all will agree that the time is now to take Hindu supremacy seriously as a form of American and transnational hate that threatens the values that we hold dearest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Audrey. And also thank you to all the panel members uh, for their opening remarks. We do have around 20 minutes for some questions. So I think I will, I will begin with the Q&A. Um, so the first question, which is addressed to the Indian professor, I'm guessing this is for Professor Apurvanan because uh, it talks about Hindutva. The question is, do Hindutva people hate all Christians and Muslims and call them anti-national? And can you tell us about the impact of this hate on evangelists, Islamists, and their institutions in India and, and the US? So, uh, Professor Purvanand, if you could take the first part of the question and, you know, how their hate impacts institutions in India, and then maybe one of the other scholars could talk about the US, I think uh, that would be really helpful. So especially last seven years, I've seen uh, full scale assault and uh, spread of hate to uh, different media 
against Muslims and uh, Christians. Uh, what it, ha it has done to universities or higher education institutions, uh, first, institutions run by minority uh, organizations or minority institutions like Aligarh Muslim University or Jamia Millia Islamia. These universities have been portrayed as dense of anti-nationalists. Uh, that is established in common Hindu mind. That's a very sad fact, but it remains a fact. And we have to deal with it. Uh, secondly, academics are seen as, especially historians and liberal academics, are seen as uh, people who are sympathetic to Muslims and Christians. And they are defamed constantly. Uh, they are called jihadists, they are called terrorists, intellectual terrorists, etc. And since uh, you keep defaming academic people, uh, the commoners or even the students start doubting the integrity of their scholarship. That's all I would like to say at this point. Uh, thank you. Would anybody also like to comment on how this is uh, how this hate basically impacts institutions um, in the U.S. and there's also mentioning evangelist and Islamist in in the U.S. So if Perhaps that question came before um, some of us spoke about this issue already. And so um, all three of us who spoke after Professor yeah. talked about it. So it's still a question. We're happy to take it up again. But I, you know, judging by the time when it came, I think this was before this was laid out. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. Thank you. Uh, okay. So I'm just going to go. So I think this is an interesting question here about are there any lessons that can be learned from other parts of the world, other periods in history that could help to preserve academic freedoms and expression in India today? Uh, what interventions can be made at this stage, if any, in the face of rising repression and majoritarianism? And I think there's a linked question to this about what can people do as concerned citizens in, in the US and um, in, in the West, which I, again, I think people have already addressed, but maybe if that could once again be addressed um, and how we can kind of build up international pressure to save or preserve academic freedom in India. Um, so I would, this isn't addressed to any uh, particular panelist. So if any of the panelists would want to take it up, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd just like to say that I think um, one thing we know from history is that anti-intellectualism and anti-democratic attitudes tend to go together. And we see that uh, in this country, we've seen this in the past coming, not that anti-intellectualism is new in America, but it's certainly come to the fore in a different way the last decade or so. And we can see that that is veering towards also a, a direct assault on democratic institutions. So while some critique of university academics might seem to be innocent in and of itself, it's actually often the beginning of a much larger agenda. And I think that is true across the world. Many, many examples can be, can be mentioned. And, and I think that's worth uh, uh, keeping in mind that this defense of academic freedom is in fact a, a defense, not just of free speech, but also defense of the right to dissent, the right to have institutions that are robust and that are willing and able to stand up to protect those freedoms. I think what's important uh, uh, to understand is that academic freedom, as uh, Professor Hansen rightly said, it's not only about uh, right to free speech, also about the right uh, of the youth and others uh, to, know, uh, to know their history and, and to get exposed to diversity of views and facts. Uh, and that is what is being stifled or obstructed when uh, ideological regimes like the Bharatiya Janata Party uh, start attacking uh, or restricting public freedom in India. Or, or elsewhere. Just add very quickly 
that there is a very important role for faculty unions where such unions actually exist in defending, supporting, and protecting faculty members from such kind of attacks. And I'm proud to say that we have such a union um, at Rutgers University, and I would really encourage um, all academics who are in the audience, if you have faced such threats, um, to contact your union, and if you don't have a union, to form one. Uh, Annapurna, I would like to uh, have half a minute. And just yeah, please go ahead. to people who, who are joining uh, us from outside India that Indian academic spaces and Indian uh, academics need your support and your solidarity. It's very important uh, for all of you to keep speaking out when you hear about attack on academic freedom, attack on teachers. Uh, uh, anywhere in India, be it small or, or big. That's very important for international community of academics to come in solidarity uh, with their Indian counterparts. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Purvanandan. I would just like to add a line to this. Uh, recently, what has been happening in the UK, anybody who's been critiquing um, Hindutva has be, is being accused of Hinduphobia, I think, as one of our panel members also mentioned. And I would really like to stress that it's really important that even if you know, you're in a Western university or um, just abroad and you, you want to talk about these things and you're not Indian, I think you should still go ahead and do it and uh, kind of tackle the challenges of, of being labeled as Hindu phobic as well. Um, okay, next I would like to uh, take up, uh, I'm just going to read out the question. Um, it's by Dipali Kul Kulkarni. And the question is from the dialogues I have seen online about US-based scholarship, it seems that there is a considerable disagreement which is being construed as an attack. The inappropriate fringe death threats aside, when and how is it appropriate for individuals to express their opinions or concern about academic arguments? I would like to invite um, Professor Audrey, if you'd want to answer the question. Thank you. Please, thank you. So first, Dipali, that is really offensive and very, very callous. The death threats are not fringe. The violent threats against me and other professors are coming fast and furious right now. And the organizations who are creating the environments for those need to take a step back and think about what they're doing. And folks, if you are part of an organization that claims to represent Hindu Americans or South Asian Americans, and you're helping to create that environment, you should be so ashamed. Your group should be actively working to condemn those threats right now, not to dismiss them. I have to walk outside with my three and five and seven year old in an hour and look all around to make sure someone's not gonna take a shot at us. So I really think you need to check yourself there. In terms of how you engage uh, sort of nicely and, and appropriately, you do not try to infringe on academic freedom. Don't try to shut down our talks. Don't try to trash our scholarship with bad faith attacks. Do not do disinformation campaigns. Do not go after us. Do not go after our families. If you want to engage in scholarly critique and criticism in good faith, that is fine. We welcome that. Scholars disagree with one another all the time. I invite you to read the AAUP 1940 Foundational Statement on Academic Freedom, which talks about what academic freedom is and how scholars can responsibly engage in criticism of one another. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Audrey. Um, there is a similar question that is being addressed to the U.S. academics, which is, have there been any legal actions against, you know, these complaints that might have been made? And if there has been action against the people who have made these uh, threats or, or online trolling? Um, and there's even been half the FBI and other related agencies also investigated these threats. So if, if one of you would like to uh, address those questions, I think that there's a whole series of them, so we can answer those first, yeah. So I, I think I'm sure Audrey has more to say about this, but I just want to say that um, I have not myself reported anything, uh, and I regret that because uh, for a long time 
I took the kind of trolling and the hateful letters and all that as a kind of professional hazard, something that I just had to live with. Uh, but I, it's as I said in my remarks, it's really escalated the last uh, five to seven years, and it has to do with the fact that many of these people, many are based uh, in North America, no doubt, uh, but they still feel that they are uh, able to act with impunity, and actually they shouldn't be. I mean, there are uh, we should report some of these, um, some of this trolling. Every personal threat should be reported to our campus security or to our police forces wherever we are. We have to mobilize not just our unions, as Deepa said, but also our universities, many of uh, uh, which are, are very strong entities with strong legal resources to protect us. Uh, that is our right, um, and, and not just in terms of First Amendment rights, but also in terms of rights as, as professionals who are working in these institutions. And, and so I personally would say that I have never reported it, but I am going to do it in the future, and I think everybody should do it. And we should get the police and the FBI and the full might of the uh, law enforcement uh, that's often used in, in wrong ways in this country, but to get them on this case, because I think the message has to be sent to these groups that this is not okay. This is actually illegal. So I agree 100%. And I will just add for myself uh, that, you know, I'm, I'm on pretty good good familiar terms with the Rutgers Police Department recently. Um, there have been a lot of threats. Uh, I have reported some, my administration has reported some, and as I mentioned in my remarks, sometimes the threats are made like more generally at Rutgers to Rutgers people, but against me. So then that gets reported and I just basically get a phone call. Like, by the way, someone threatened to kill you again. And I, I've been in touch with multiple other police departments. I have had extra security and drive-bys of my home at times. I have required armed security to speak in multiple US states, certainly in India. Um, I think we've gone so far as to talk with prosecutors. I, I mean, it, I think there are a couple of things to say. One is that this is a huge distraction from scholarship um, in addition to imperiling you know, with us personally, that this this in and of itself is distracting from scholarship and thus an infringement on academic freedom. Another thing is that it's difficult because every time we go to a new police department, um, we have to explain this all over again. What is Hindutva? What is Hindu nationalism? How is this relevant in the US context? And I think that's part of why events like this are so important because we need greater awareness in American culture and society so that Hindu supremacists can be seen for what they are. To, to summarize what Professor Kumar said, they're much closer to people like white supremacists than they are to Hindus. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Uh, oh, sorry. May I just speak very quickly? Um, so I personally have not uh, received these kinds of horrific threats uh, that others, uh, the other colleagues on this um, a panel have because this is not my area of research. I am here to stand in solidarity with these incredible colleagues who have had the courage to speak today and whether not just one month or two months but years of such attacks uh, and so mad respect for all of you and I stand in solidarity with you. I also am here because I wanted to bring uh, to the world what is happening to the conflict dismantling global Hindutva multidisciplinary perspectives. Several speakers at that conference have been threatened with rape threats, death threats, uh, and so forth. Al Jazeera has written uh, an article on it. People can Google and see what these threats have looked like. Um, not to mention, of course, the very attempts to uh, try to shut the conference down. So um, there is a legal team, I understand. I was informed before I came onto this uh, panel that has been formed that is going to contact, if not has already contacted, the ACLU, the FBI, as well as various uh, state authorities to look into the threats to conference speakers and to make sure that everyone is protected and kept safe. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Deepa. And I'm really glad that the conference is still going ahead, you know, um, despite despite everything that has happened. That's really commendable. Um, okay, so the next question is, is I think, for uh, Professor Purvanand, which is, does India have an official clause or statement on what is academic freedom and how is it implemented within the higher education system? Um, if there is, how can this be changed? And there's a similar linked question by Arvinder Singh, which is the attack on JNU on students and professors during the BJP government. Uh, did the government charge the people who attacked the students and the professors? I mean, I think a lot of people might already know the answer, but, uh, but if you could just yeah, give an idea to us, that would be helpful. Yeah, thank you. The answer to both the questions is no. Okay, <laughs> um, thank you. So, okay. Uh, so there are a couple of questions about uh, the distinction between Hinduism and Hindutva. Um, I'm going to read out, I think, uh, one of them by, by Armand. And I'm, I'm aware we're running out of time and this might be a more theoretical discussion, but, but maybe if you could just address it briefly, which is whenever there's talk of Hindutva uh, that takes place, we usually see a binary between Hinduism and Hindutva. But if you go by history and politics of creating Hinduism, Hinduism is putting a blanket of unity on the different school of thoughts that never share that unity. Uh, but that unity was created as opposed to Islam or Christianity. Um, and Hinduism became the religion of land while Islam became the religion of, of uh, the other or invader. So can there be a critique of Hindutva without being critical to Hinduism, its history and politics? And there's a linked question about uh, intersection of, of caste and, and Hindutva as well. Um, so, would anybody want to address this question? So, I think that there's basically nothing in that question that was accurate. Um, folks, if you think that Hindutva is bringing unity to Hinduism, number one, you need to learn a lot more about the history of Hinduism. Number two, you need to read Savarkar, right? Vidi Savarkar, the godfather of, of Hindutva ideology, was very clear on this, right? One of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Vinayak Chaturvedi, just published a very nice piece a couple of days ago about this, where he points out that according to the Hindu right of today, Savarkar was the ultimate Hindu foe, basically, because he was incredibly critical of religious Hindus. He thought it was ridiculous tradition. He thought the whole cow, cow reverence thing was, was weakening Hindus. And if you're offended by that, you're upset at Savarkar, not a professor, Audrey Trashke. Folks, Hindutva is a political ideology. Hinduism is a religion. They are different categories. The only conflation that occurs here is by folks who are trying to promote Hindutva and don't want to stand up and have the world see their bigotry and prejudice in the light of day. And so they try to cover themselves in the cloak of Hinduism. That's really offensive. They should really stop doing that. Uh, I just, I, yeah, go I, on. Yes. Uh, Yes, sorry, Professor Bhuvan, please go ahead, uh, or Professor Thomas. No, I just want to second what, what uh, uh, Audrey said, that um, the Hindutva is, is an ideology that's about creating a state that is a home for Hindus, uh, to have a, 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 a state that is uh, for Hindus as a kind of Hindu homeland. This is what they are very explicit about. This is what Savarka writes about 1920s as a goal. Um, uh, many current members of the RSS are not seen often in temples. Um, many of them see themselves as a kind of organizers behind the scenes where the religious practices is just one of the things they see themselves as protecting, but they themselves are not uh, active uh, uh, practicing Hindus in, in that sort of sense we normally associate with the term. So these are two different things. It, it is a political movement that is using, as it were, a huge, diverse and internally differentiated tradition that we call Hinduism as a front for a project that really is about building a particular kind of state that is not democratic, that is majoritarian, uh, and that has no freedom uh, for only for, for, for most of the people, except the people that the RSS uh, tend to agree with. Thank you. Uh, I would like to add to what uh, Professor Audrey and Professor Hansen had just said. Uh, I would simplify things and say that uh, the 
Hindutva project or the project of the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh is to create a, a Hindu who hates Muslims and Jews. That is a Hindu uh, RSS wants to create through constant education in its shakhas, uh, through its Saraswati Shishu Mandir, through Ekal Vidyalayas, through Vidya Bharati, Seva Bharati, and hundreds of organizations, autonomous, semi-autonomous, and affiliated to the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh. It's to create a Hindu mind, uh, 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 hates Muslims and Christians and other minorities. Uh, this is, of course, a simplification, but help you understand what Hindutva is and how it is different from Hinduism. I just want to add very quickly that there are really good people who unfortunately have accepted the propaganda from uh, Hindutva forces because they're confused. They have accepted that this is, you know, uh, people like Professor Hansen or Trushki are actually bashing Hinduism and it's an attack on their person and so on, when in fact that's absolutely not the case. Their work is focused on Hindutva. So I think it's really important that people educate themselves about what is at work, who the forces are, what this ideology is. And for that, it is for exactly for that reason that this conference has been organized. Please Google Dismantling Global Hindutva Multidisciplinary Perspectives. It is a three-day conference starting this Friday and going on till Sunday. Come, listen, educate yourself. If you still disagree, that's totally fine, but at least you will have all the information that you need to make an informed decision uh, about what is going on, about what these forces are, and whether or not you still want to be part of the uh, you know, Hindutva uh, right. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Um... Okay, I think there's a question about why is why are we skirting around the elephant in the room? Why don't we call the problem what it really is, which is RSS and, and BJP, but I feel we've done that enough already. Um, and I think let's let's move on to the last question because it's also almost, uh, it's over an hour right now. So the last question is going to be, I think, more about how we are planning to resist this, to fight this. So first of all, are the academics in the US who are fighting back the Hindutva ideology aligning with academics universities in the UK? Um, I would say that that is kind of happening, but I would invite the panelists to also share their opinions. And, and the second uh, linked question is, that there is a familiar pattern of denying, distorting, and devaluing people, their cultures based on dom uh, domineering perspectives of history. One example is removing any discussion on critical race theory now that has happened in the US and also, also in the UK. So this patriarchy, caste supremacy strands are so clear in both white supremacy and also Hindutva ideology. Do you think we should be addressing these common experiences simultaneously and how can we build the solidarity more? So I think if if um, if maybe all of the panel members could kind of uh, have to, uh, say something on this and and we'll take it from there. So yeah, uh, Professor yeah. Purvanand, would you want to go first? Yeah. I think, I think we must realize, as as my colleagues have uh, have rightly said, that it's it's an attack on scholarship. It's an attack on knowledge creation, and that is how it should be seen. It is political, but it's also about knowledge. It's also about scholarship. And that is why we need an international solidarity and international unity, so to say, uh, to, to combat what is happening in India and what now uh, our colleagues in, in, in the universities in US and UK and, and other uh, countries are facing, that it has become impossible to do scholarship on India in a disinterested manner. If you do not serve uh, the so-called nationalistic politics of the Bharati Janata Party and Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, you would be defamed, uh, defamed like uh, uh, Professor Romila Thapar and others have been done in India. And now the attacks that uh, Professor Audrey and others are facing, you would be defamed and people would stop reading you. Uh, that is how it works. Uh, your book, your books won't be read. Uh, 
uh, won't be prescribed uh, by universities. And that is how scholarship stops. So we have to, uh, we have to uh, first describe it uh, aptly, that it's an attack on scholarship. And therefore, we need an international solidarity to, to combat it and, and to keep calling it out uh, and not and get tired. Thank if you I so may, much, uh, Professor Deepa. Would you? Oh, sorry. No, go on. Go on. Professor Deepa, go on. Deepa would you want to go next? I just started yeah, going. You're the, going in the order, order that we had initially. Yes, yeah, so. yes, no problem. Yeah. I really appreciate the question that the person had about linking these various forms of attack, uh, not just on academic freedom, but also on uh, critical race theory. Um, I do think that it's very important to talk about uh, the way in which far right wing forces are pra do have practically the same playbook, right? Um, white supremacists, uh, Hindu supremacists, uh, authoritarian right-wing forces in various countries around the world who are anti-Muslim and who are sexist and who are homophobic and so on, they've all taken a, a page from, you know, certain scholarly traditions where uh, they have managed to diffuse attacks against themselves by somehow claiming that critiquing them is Hinduphobia or you know, it's reverse racism or what have you. And I think it's important to do comparative analysis of these things in an intellectual way, but to also organize together, recognizing that all of our faiths are tied together, whether we are Hindu, whether we are Muslim, whether we are white American working class, uh, you know, whatever our nationality and race. The thing is, these authoritarian figures want to create a world where democracy, free speech, academic freedom, uh, secularism don't exist anymore. And we're all threatened by that. And I do agree with that question that we have to talk about all these things in really linked manners and build a politics of solidarity to fight back. Uh, yes, Professor Thomas, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's just to add, uh, Two small points. One is that uh, the, the, the anxiety and the attacks on critical race theory is, is akin to the attacks on, on ideas of, of uh, multiplicity and uh, uh, diversity in India, right? An anxiety about a, 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 a hegemony, a certain cultural hegemony of Hindus being um, challenged, right? And that's why that often leads into also a defense of, uh, um, of um, of, for instance, the caste system as intrinsic to Hinduism and, and attacks on, on, on those who, uh, who criticize uh, caste practices, especially Dalit scholars and activists. So, so there is that, that's one thing. The other thing I think is that um, you could say the, the, uh, the, the, there is a similar playbook, but in India, a lot of, um, uh, I remember RSS people telling me that, you know, we are, are Hindus and because Hinduism is not really a religion, it's a way of life, it's a culture. So uh, we cannot be intolerant like other, those other people like Muslims and Christians who are intolerant. So that also means that if you say anything critical about, about uh, us, right, you, you are attacking Hindu culture as a whole. So I think there is a, a way of they sort of try to weaponize this idea that you know, uh, Hinduism is is a is a way of life, and that's a, a program that's much easier to recruit uh, lots of people on. You know, to say we are just defending your right, not just to, to be Hindus in a religious sense, but to be to live the way in which you are defending your tradition and so on. And that's that's um, I think the specific sort of uh, line or stra strategy of, of the Hindu nationalists that they are in a sense trying to, to make this overarching cultural argument, which is uh, speaks to a certain kind of common sense understanding of what India is among lots of people in India. And that, that is something Bond also needs to address. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Audrey, would you like to go next? Please, thank you. So in, in terms of thinking about kind of right, right wing similarities and networks, I think both of those are really useful to think about the ways in which 
right wing groups representing different nationalists and different supremacist ideologies echo one another and borrow from each other's playbook. I think it's also useful to try to trace real tangible contacts between them. And one, one thing that has been helpful to me is working with and allying with, people, with scholars who are outside of South Asian studies. Um, a colleague of mine who has nothing to do with South Asian studies, for example, noticed some links between a US-based Hindu supremacist group and the Koch network, which is the source of probably still the majority of, of attacks on academic freedom in the United States, very extreme right-wing group. That's very useful. Right, and, and that has interested a number of, of colleagues with whom I share that, that little tidbit. In, in terms of how we proceed, I mean, I, I wish I had a clear answer to that, but I'll tell you how I see others proceeding and how I'm going to proceed. How I see many of my colleagues proceeding, and I am so proud to be a part of this, is that we're all talking about Hindutva, Hindu nationalism, Hindu supremacy, a whole lot more, right? This is not the, the field, forgive me, Professor Hansen, of more fringe interest when, when you began this stuff. Everyone's talking about this now. And due to the pushback against the Dismantling Global Hindutva Conference, I am aware of at least one further event that it, people are talking about scheduling now, multi-panels devoted to Hindutva. So I think the more we get pushback, the more we're gonna talk about it because we have to. Personally, speaking only for myself, at the end of the day, I mean, I wear many hats, but I am primarily a pre-modern historian. So I'm going to continue doing that. I'm going to continue to work on the Mughals and other Indo-Persian dynasties, on Hindu-Muslim interactions, and on composite culture in pre-modern India. Yeah, thanks, Professor Audrey. Um, I would like to thank all of the panelists again. Thank you so much for taking out your time, your energy, and also just uh, you know sharing your experiences with us. And also that we we need to continue uh, fighting in all in all possible ways. Um, I I feel compelled to say that you know even the question and answers this thing is being bombarded right now. So that shows the extent to which there is an attempt to silence people. Uh, yeah, there is absolutely no need. I would wouldn't recommend the panelists to open it up but yeah so it just shows the extent of the threat which which we're dealing with right now um with that we have come to an end to this congressional briefing and i would just like to thank all of the panel members once again and also all the co-sponsoring organizations so i'm quickly going to read out uh, the name of the co-sponsoring organizations for this panel and and we'll wrap up after that right so there's the indian american muslim council amnesty international usa Hindus for Human Rights, Scholars at Risk, 21 Wilberforce, International Christian Concern, Dalit Solidarity Forum, Federation of Indian American Christians of North America, India Civil Watch International, Jubilee Campaign USA, New York State Council of Churches, Students Against Hindutva Ideology, uh, American Muslim Institution, Association of Indian Muslims of America, Center of Pluralism, International Society for Peace and Justice, the Humanism Project and International Solidarity for Academic Freedom in India, that's that's in South. Um, again, thank you so much. And uh, hope that these webinars are part of a series which will keep continuing. So please feel free to join them and also share the message. Thank you. <laughs>